Well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on myostatin. We'd like to thank Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer, our educational partners, for their support in presenting today's webinar on understanding myostatin inhibition. Um, as you all know, myostatin has been in our community and being discussed for, for a number of years. We've had some disappointing results um, with the Acceleron study and before that with Wyeth's study. So we wanted um, Dr. Sweeney to bring us up to date with where are we and what does myostatin do and what have we learned along the way. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Sweeney. Lee Sweeney is uh, the director of the University of Florida Myology Institute, and he comes to us today to present um, on myostatin. Lee? Thanks, Pat. Uh, I'm glad I can be with you today to talk a little bit about the potential for myostatin inhibition as a treatment for, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, there we go. Uh, so, as all of you know, since you're all familiar, very familiar with this disease, uh, the protein that's missing, dystrophin, has a number of roles in the cell, in the muscle cells. Uh, primarily to transmit force from the contractile apparatus, but also it's an organizing and signaling protein. And so when it's lost, there's a number of functions of the muscle uh, downstream of just the, the mechanical rupture of the membrane because of the lack of dystrophin that, that are problematic and, and really drive the disease progression. At the very bottom of, of this slide, you, you see I note the fact that there's a major ongoing inflammatory response uh, with activation of fibroblasts that lead to fibrosis that in the end really prevents the regeneration of the muscle so that gradually muscle is lost uh, and, and not replaced and instead of it being repaired, it's replaced by uh, fat and c connective tissue by fibrosis. And that's shown very nicely in, in these cross-sectional MR images. These are uh, what is known as P1 uh, weighted MR um, magnetic resonance images uh, from boys of different ages with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And as you can appreciate, uh, looking at this boy who's age five, there's very little of this white um, matter uh, that you see in the older boys, especially in this 14-year-old boy. And basically what this is showing you is that the muscles have very little fibrosis and, and fat at age five, but as the, boy, as the boy's age, the, the muscle itself is gradually replaced by fat, uh, which is what you really can see here, but it would get embedded Hi, in this sorry, fat. Sorry, one second. Could you just speak a little more into the microphone? You're getting a little muffled. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Maybe if I – is that better? Yes, that's better. Uh, this this fat is, is essentially embedded in a matrix of, of, of fibrosis, uh, which was laid down by the fibroblasts. And the problem with is that as this matrix gets more fibrotic and then more fatty, it, it no longer is a matrix in which one can regenerate muscle. And so the, the normal progression uh, of, of repair and remodeling that happens in skeletal muscle and happens in all of our skeletal muscle is called upon to happen at a much higher rate in Duchenne muscle because of the fact that with the stroke and missing, the muscle is much more susceptible to injury. Uh, and it, it involves a, a, a very uh, nice sequence of events uh, that have to occur in, in just the right order in, in, involving inflammation uh, and then matrix remodeling by the fibroblast that then uh, eventually allows successful repair by the satellite cells, which are the muscle stem cells. So this is the, the normal process of regeneration. As I said, in Duchenne, this process is activated at such a high level that it eventually fails and inflammation and, and fibrosis uh, really just sort of block the regeneration and eventually the matrix is no longer modeled in such a way that it is susceptible to normal regeneration and, and you, you no longer can repair the muscle. So on, on that original slide, I noted the slide I showed you two back, I, I noted that uh, regeneration in skeletal muscle is controlled largely by the signaling of IGF-1 shown here, which really is, is the primary thing that's driving growth, but it's also important in the satellite cells to, to drive their proliferation and differentiation to allow them to fuse with the muscle cells. And then there's a, another signaling pathway 
which is the one we're going to focus on today, which is myostatin. Uh, and myostatin actually is, is putting a break on the IGF-1 signaling. And you can see in this little diagram that it puts a break on, on this little uh, oval called AKT. So IGF-1 drives AKT signaling, uh, and, and myostatin signaling blocks uh, this AKT signaling. So you can basically look at myostatin as something that's controlling the gain on the IGF-1 signaling. If you have more myostatin signaling, you get less signaling through uh, IGF-1. If you take away myostatin signaling, then for the same amount of IGF-1, you would potentially get more signaling. So, so one could imagine therapeutically either getting more IGF-1, which is something we've tried to do at mice, uh, but it's not so practical in, in humans, or inhibiting myostatin. And a number of ways to do this have been uh, devised, and some of them are now in the clinic. And so that's what we're going to talk about. But you'll also notice there's another pathway here, uh, labeled BMPs, which can also inhibit myostatin. And so you've got these three parallel pathways. So, so what is myostatin? What is G, GDF11? What is actin? What are these things that put the brakes on muscle growth? And then what are these BMPs uh, and, and um, that, that can actually relieve the break uh, to some extent on muscle growth? Well, it turns out that all of these molecules are part of a large superfamily that includes TGF beta. And you may remember that TGF beta is the primary molecule that's really causing the fibroblasts to proliferate and differentiate and then drives the fibrosis. So TGF beta is shown on this slide. Uh, it, it's this little grouping, TGF beta 1, 2, and 3. This is really the, the player that's driving all the fibrosis. And this is really, in the end, is what, what uh, is a, a lot of efforts are, are going into trying to figure out ways to try to inhibit this, to inhibit fibrosis directly. But very closely related uh, are, are these molecules called GDF11 and GDF8. Now, GDF8 is, is what is currently called myostatin. But you'll notice there are other things that are in this family called BNPs. Uh, and all of these, these molecules, which is, stands for bone morphogenic protein, all of these mo molecules have this similar structure shown here, where uh, they have what is known as a prodomain or uh, propeptide. Uh, is, and I'll refer to it later. Uh, then they have a, a cleavage site. Uh, and then the, the end of the molecule is really the business end. This is where the signaling takes place. You'll notice this whole molecule is, is basically a dimer of two identical molecules that are crosslinked. And this, the muscle cells themselves secrete this into the matrix surrounding them where, where they're basically parked in a depot uh, and until something causes this site to be cleaved, releasing the, the business end of the molecule, which then can diffuse and, and bind to a receptor that's made up of a type 1 and type 2 receptor. So you'll hear about the active and type 2 receptor because that's the type of receptor that, uh, the type 2 receptor that myostatin signals through. As I said, um, it is it's these two guys that we're going to focus on today. They're very closely related. GDF8 and GDF11 are both expressed in skeletal muscle and in, uh, and in the heart. Uh, and myostatin is relatively selective for skeletal muscle and, and um, adipose tissue fat, uh, which is one of the reasons why targeting myostatin is so attractive, is because it's not found in all the cells of the body like a lot of these other molecules are. It's really restricted to a, a large extent to muscle. Now, Sage and Lee, some years ago, was systematically knocking out these members of the TGF family that are known as uh, GDFs. So that GDF stands for growth and differentiation factor. So myostatin uh, was growth and differentiation factor eight. And when he knocked that out in mice, this is what he saw. So this, is, this began the huge interest in myostatin because when he knocked out myostatin so that the mice never expressed it during their whole development or in, the, in their adult life, they had these giant muscles, these, these double-muscled uh, animals, because they had not only bigger muscle fibers, but they had a lot more muscle fibers. And this is al also true in cattle that had been bred in Europe for generations. Uh, they had these so-called double-muscled cattle. Once Sage and Lee discovered 
Maya Satin by knocking it out in mice, uh, he and his team sequenced the, uh, the Maya Satin gene in these cattle and found out that they also uh, had mutations that caused the loss of Maya Satin. And so without knowing it, people had been breeding Maya Satin in all cows because of their, their giant amount of meat, because of this, this increase in fiber number, uh, as well as the size of the individual fibers. And not too long after that, there was a child born in Germany who a neurologist thought looked incredibly muscular. Uh, and knowing the myostatin story, uh, this child was then genotyped and, and turned out to be born from two parents uh, who ha each had one good copy and one uh, mutant copy of myostatin. And, and this, this boy got two mutant copies uh, and therefore was a myostatin null. So the reason I'm showing you the, 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 the mice, the cows, and the boy is because it, it was really the first strong evidence that myostatin signaling is conserved in all mammals, including humans, and therefore uh, whatever we show in mice and other mammals is likely to be true in human in terms of myostatin signaling. So in terms of the big picture, uh, we've talked a lot, you've heard, those of you who've heard me talk before, I know that I'm, that very much interested in the idea of combination therapies uh, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, therapies uh, that would target a number of different of the pathways that are defective in this disease. Uh, obviously, putting back dystrophin or trying to upregulate eutrophin is the most direct way to deal with the disease. But, but these other pathways uh, could be equally advantageous, especially when in, uh, used in combination. And first and foremost on that list is increasing muscle mass and regeneration. And therefore, uh, we and others have been long interested in this as a possibility. And the first, the first work we did uh, was actually, even before myostatin had been discovered, we were showing uh, that increasing IGF-1 specifically in skeletal muscle, not in the whole body, but just in the whole muscle, uh, just in the skeletal muscle, which you could do with virus. Uh, in a way that you can't do uh, with giving something uh, in, in the circulation. So we were able to show that increasing IGF-1 just in the muscle uh, increased the regenerative capacity, gave hypertrophy, uh, and inhibited fibrosis if you put it into NDX mice. And you can just see here, see on this next slide, what that looks like. You can see that the, the muscle that's overexpressing IGF-1 uh, but still missing dystrophin looks quite a bit healthier than the one on the left that is not overexpressing IGF-1. Uh, and you can also appreciate that it's somewhat, this, this muscle is somewhat larger. It's about 10 to 15 percent larger and stronger uh, than, than this muscle. Now, as I said, it doesn't, we, we don't have a good way of trying to implement an upregulation of IGF-1 just in the muscle in, in a, a safe manner at this point. But, but I also have already told you that if you could decrease myostatin, it would be somewhat like uh, increasing IGF-1 in that you would get more signaling from the IGF-1 that is in the muscle. And so, so that is why we and others have been interested in, in inhibiting myostatin as a more practical way to go about uh, achieving increased muscle mass and regeneration. So how, how can you do that? Well, there, there are a number of ways one can think about doing it. The way that we've done it in animals uh, is the overexpression of the myostatin propeptide. So that is the piece that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, basically is involved in parking the whole myostatin in the uh, matrix surrounding the skeletal muscle fibers until it's activated. Uh, but if you overexpress it without the business end on it, what you can do is basically compete the full-length myostatin out of the depot, and therefore it's not available in the tissue for signaling. And so in, in that sense, you're inhibiting myostatin by basically out-competing it with this propeptide. There are other ways to inhibit myostatin, and we're going to come back to those. But before I, I talk about the other ways of inhibiting myostatin, I want to show you the results uh, and discuss a little bit the results in animals with, with this propeptide inhibition of myostatin approach. Uh, so the idea here is that we get systemic inhibition, so all muscles in the body, uh, by secreting this propeptide at high concentrations from the liver. 
So basically made an and no associated virus uh, that, ex that expresses only in the liver and had it pump this propeptide into the circulation. Uh, and then we did this both in, in mice and in dogs. I'm just going to summarize the, the mouse data and then show you a, a little bit of the dog data. But the summary of the mouse experiments, and this, this the night taught us some interesting lessons, because we were interested in looking at myostatin inhibition in a number of settings, not just in the dystrophic muscle. And what we saw was that as you went from old adult skeletal muscle, where we, with myostatin inhibition, we only saw about 5 to 10 percent inhibition, to young adult skeletal muscles, where if we inhibited uh, with myostatin uh, uh, Propeptide, you got 10 to 15 percent increase in, in muscle mass. Uh, whereas in the neonates, if we did the same thing, we got 25 to 40 percent increase in muscle mass. And then in the MDX animals, we actually saw the greatest increase in muscle mass of all, because, uh, which is on the order of 30 to 50 percent. Now we think this is in large part because when the muscles are rapidly growing, uh, as they are in the neonatal animals, or rapidly remodeling, as they are in the dystrophic animals, this creates an environment where the myostatin uh, inhibition is really amplified and one gets more and more fat. And then once the animals are fully grown, you still get hypertrophy if you inhibit myostatin, but it, it's less and becomes less, even less as the animals get older. So this is an important lesson because uh, some of you may be disappointed by what you've heard from the uh, myostatin inhibition and the healthy volunteers, which you know it's on the order of, of maybe 5% or so uh, on average between the different studies that have been made public. But, but bear in mind that, that even in normal, unaffected mice, uh, as they get older, we, we also don't see very much hypertrophy uh, in that setting if we just inhibit, and yet we see this tremendous hypertrophy in the dystrophic test. So nonetheless, we wanted to move to dogs because dogs are really a much better model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, when they're missing dystrophin than are the mice. So the, the dog disease is quite a bit more severe than what it, um, the MDX mouse has. Uh, but importantly, the dog fiber type distribution. So your skeletal muscle has different types of fibers. It has slow fibers and fast fibers. And within the fast fibers, there are subtypes of fast fibers. And the dog fiber type distribution is very similar to what we have in humans, whereas the mouse fiber type distribution is very skewed to the fastest fiber. So it's a very different fiber type distribution. And the reason this is important is that the density of the receptors for the myostatin are, are, are much higher in the fast fibers and the, and the fastest fibers than they are in the slow fibers. And so uh, we were not sure that we could achieve as much hypertrophy in the dog with this fiber type distribution as we saw in the mouse. And that would have implications for what you might see in humans. And also in the mice, uh, when you inhibit myostatin, especially if you start in, in, in juvenile animals, you actually get fiber type shifts in the muscles from the slow fiber types to faster fiber types, and especially to the fast glycolytic fiber types. And that could mean a decrease in endurance in the muscle as you're, you're shifting to fiber types that have less and less in the way of mitochondria. And so that, that could have implications as well as, as metabolic implications. And then Lastly, we did see some mild hypertrophy in the mice as they got older, the MDX mice as they got older, when we had myostatin in addition, although their, their cardiac function was still within the normal range. And so, so we, we wanted to look in a more severe model to make sure that there wouldn't be any acceleration of the cardiomyopathy uh, that, that one has with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Because myostatin uh, also can inhibit the the growth of cardiomyocytes, and taking that away could be a bad thing, could be a good thing. We, we don't really know, uh, and but we, we didn't have a good mouse model to investigate it. So uh, again, we used the systemic inhibition of myostatin by secreting the propeptide from the liver. We waited, in the data I'm going to show you, we waited until the dogs were fully grown, 10 to 12 months of age, because we wanted to be able to say very precisely how much hypertrophy we got from myostatin. And if they're growing animals, then they're getting hypertrophy just because they're getting larger. So we, we didn't want to confuse the two. We have done some studies in, in uh, dogs right after weaning as well, uh, just to, to see what the effect is there. But there it's harder to tease the, the growth effect away from 
the myostatin effect in terms of the fiber sizes. So we, we measured the, the by MR the, the muscle volumes uh, during that year that we uh, allowed them to be exposed to the myostatin inhibitor. And then at the end of that year, we sacrificed the dogs and did histological assessments of all of their skeletal muscles. And throughout, we were assessing their cardiac function, uh, mostly by echo, but we also did a, a handful of cardiac MRI. So the, this is just showing you the, a cross-section through the muscle and a volumetric reconstruction of the muscles of the dog's hind limb. And basically what we saw was at, so now, point time zero is actually when the dogs are about a year of age, between 10 and 12 months of age. But what we saw is once we injected the dogs at that age with the virus that would start secreting the inhibitor from their liver, is we saw a progressive uh, increase in the size of the muscles, both the cross-sectional area <coughs> and the muscle volumes, uh, which uh, plateaued in some muscles at, at, at about maybe four to six months, and then some muscles continued to creep up over time. And basically, compared to control animals, uh, we, we saw significant increases on the order of as much as 25%, which is, you know, similar to what we saw in the, in the dystrophic mice. And so this was quite interesting that we were getting, in some muscles, almost as much as we saw in the mice, other muscles on the order of maybe 10% or so. <laughs> and the overall... Um, anterior compartment volume of, of the hind limb showed about a 20% hypertrophy over this period of time as compared uh, to the control muscles. <clears throat> now, what about the, the health of the muscle, the quality of the muscle? Well, first of all, the myostatin inhibition did not change the fiber types. But just as we'd seen in the mice, the hypertrophy was relatively restricted to the fast fibers. So in muscles uh, in the dog, which were primarily type one in type 2A fibers, uh, most of the hyper, well, essentially all of the hypertrophy was coming from hypertrophy of the 2A fibers. And in muscles that had 2A and 2B fibers, there was actually more hypertrophy in the 2B fibers than the 2A fibers. So it's, it's the same situation, very little hypertrophy. There, in some muscles, we can see some, but it was, it failed to be significant. Uh, but, but very little hypertrophy in the type 1 fibers. Uh, and considerable hypertrophy in the fast fibers. Obviously, we haven't put dystrophin back, so CK levels are still elevated, but with the more successful regeneration that's going on, uh, the muscles are not as leaky, so you do see uh, a significant decrease in the circulating levels of CK uh, as compared to untreated dogs. And this is probably a little bit misleading because these animals have more muscle than the untreated dogs. And so as the dogs get older without treatment, the CK levels start to go down because they're losing muscle. Here we have more muscle, but still the CK levels are lower. So it's on, a, on a muscle per muscle basis, we've probably lowered the CK to a greater extent than, than this would lead you to believe. If you look at the histology of the muscles, you can see that the treated muscles look much healthier than the untreated muscles. You don't see these large areas of fibro fatty de uh, deposits. You do see fibrosis, but remember, we did not start treating these dogs until they were a, a year of age, and so they already had a lot of pre-existing fibrosis. Nonetheless, it significantly less. It probably did not progress to the same extent at all as it did in the untreated dogs. So, Lee, could you just um, equate a one-year-old dog with an age, for instance, of a child? Can you give us that comparator? Yeah, well, dogs are a little bit nonlinear in terms of their human uh, sort of aging, but but in general, people think of you know seven years, uh, 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 one dog year is about seven human years. So we we started this, and this is actually the other reason we wanted to start at one year because we, we think you know that that in dog years that's more like the age group that we're, we were sort of spanning the age range that these patients are likely to be spanning, and so they're going to start with pre-existing disease that maybe it's similar to what we started our dogs with. So it's it's not an unfair comparison where we started in dogs with no disease and then said, this, does it have any impact? We started with dogs that had significant disease progression already and then asked, can we, can we change that disease progression? So we think it really is a model that is not dissimilar to what's going to be, uh, in terms of the ages, not in disease stage, not dissimilar to what you're going to see 
uh, in the human patient. So, so basically, the 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 sort of summary of what we saw in the dog was that the myostatin inhibition was able to drive significant hypertrophy, 15 to 25 percent in most of the muscles, as well as decreased fibrosis in in the hind limb muscles, as well as in the diaphragm. I, I didn't show diaphragm, but it decreased the fibrosis in the diaphragm as well. And this is despite the fact that there's a lot more slow fiber types in, in these animals, just like there are in us. We also saw no shifts in fiber type distributions, which we think is a good thing in terms of not changing the endurance and the metabolic properties of the muscle. So while what we also have seen, both in the dogs and in mice, is that the myostatin inhibition has little or no impact on normal cardiac function, but we still were worried about this possibility that it could accelerate late-stage cardiomyopathy. So far, our dog data does not show that. What we've seen in the dogs was that there is absolutely no acceleration of the cardiac disease. The dogs all have normal cardiac function, and we're not really significantly different from the untreated dogs, and perhaps even a little better than the untreated dogs. But further study really is needed to address the impact if you were to start the treatment when there was already a, a late-stage cardiac disease, would that be a good or a bad thing? We just can't answer that question at this time. But nonetheless, these early human trials are going to be in boys uh, that have no discernible cardiomyopathy, and uh, they're in ambulatory boys at, at an age where the cardiomyopathy is, is not a, an issue, and so we think they're probably going to be quite safe. In any case, we always think that prophylactic use of cardioprotective drugs is a great idea in this population, uh, and it would really add added safety uh, in the context of a myostatin inhibitory trial. So the bottom line is, just as we had shown um, five years earlier uh, with IGF-1, myostatin inhibition is, in fact, able to recapitulate a lot of the same benefits uh, and, and is much more targeted uh, to skeletal muscle, uh, to striated muscle, then is uh, I, then one could do with IGF-1 upregulation. So we think inhibition of myostatin is able to provide uh, increased regenerative capacity, hypertrophy, and blood fibrosis. Certainly in our animal models, and, and based on the data we've seen, we think if the inhibitors are good enough, uh, then they should be able to recapitulate what we've seen in the dogs and gives considerable benefit. So what is the t what are the types of inhibitors that one could think of? <coughs> well, as I, as I mentioned, uh, we use the, the propeptide, which is fairly specific. It will inhibit myostatin. It will also probably inhibit GDF-11 now, so it's not totally specific. Uh, but what it won't do is it won't inhibit activin uh, in general, although it, it, we have some evidence that it might slightly inhibit uh, activin D. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't inhibit a, a number of other members of the TGF-beta family. Now, folostatin, on the other hand, is another agent. Uh, but folostatin can bind um, not only um, myostatin and GDF-11, but it also can bind a number of different activins. And so the, the good, there's a good and bad when you do that. I mean, if you bind the activins that are driving that are also inhibiting muscle hypertrophy and anything after the A is the, the main one doing uh, that, then it, you could maybe even get more hypertrophy. But on the other hand, when you're talking about putting fulvostatin throughout the body, uh, then you may have effects you don't want because you'll, you'll inhibit active and signaling in, in cells other than skeletal muscle. Now, you may all be aware that during Mendel's and during a gene therapy trial where he's expressing fulvostatin in the skeletal muscle, and what's really nice about Jerry's trial is that the folostatin is made in the skeletal muscle and pretty much is staying in the skeletal muscle. And so you don't have effects on other tissues. You just have the beneficial effect on the muscle, where now you're inhibiting both myostatin and potentially active in A and getting even more hypertrophy than uh, inhibiting myostatin alone. Um, so so that's, that's a good, a, a, probably a, a greater benefit to the patients he's looking at. Now, we think inhibiting myostatin alone is, it may be sufficient in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I didn't show you the, the data, but we did a head to head comparison in mice of the propeptide, which essentially inhibits myostatin and GDF11, and of this idea, this receptor ectodomain. And you may remember this, this as the 
uh, strategy that I'll, I'll mention in a minute that was used by Acceleron. So it's taking a soluble piece of the receptor that binds all of these active and ligands, uh, as well as myostatin and GDF11, putting it in the circulation and, and basically asking what that does. Well, that gives more hypertrophy uh, in normal muscle than just inhibiting myostatin alone. But when we did it in dystrophic muscle, we did not see any added hypertrophy. So we think we've sort of maxed the system out by just inhibiting myostatin. We think that's a good thing because we think it can give you, in, at least in the in the Duchenne setting, maybe a, a, the most of the benefit without with lower risk of any side effects by inhibiting other members of the family. So let's let's look at the approaches people are doing. So the, the first approach is is to make neutralizing agents, mostly antibodies, against myostatin. And so Pfizer and Regeneron and Lilly and BMS all have myostatin neutralizing agents. They're antibodies except in the case of BMS, which is a, an adnectin, uh, which is a so-called uh, uh, antibody, uh, not an antibody, but uh, a, a different technology um, uh, in, involving um, a fibronectin, uh, and, and it's called uh, a fibr fibronectin domain. It's called a monobody, uh, which has some advantages over an antibody. But in, uh, I won't get into that. But the, the bottom line is is that uh, it all of these inhibit. Myostatin. Now, all of these, to some extent, probably inhibit GDF11 as well, just as our propeptide did. So we're probably taking out them both. But at least in skeletal muscle, myostatin is the primary player. There's very little GDF11. Um, I've already mentioned the propeptide. No one is taking that into the clinic at this point. Um, Folostatin has been in the clinic and is in the clinic in the form of a gene therapy, which, as I said, uh, allows the folostatin in some patient settings probably to be more efficacious in terms of the hypertrophy than myostatin in addition alone. And by keeping it in the muscle, you, you minimize potential off-target effects. Uh, the act antibody against the activin 2B receptor has been developed by Novartis. That, again, has the potential of giving you even more hypertrophy than inhibiting myostatin alone but again has the potential of doing things in other cells that may or may not be good, and only time will tell whether that's tolerable. Uh, the bottom uh, category, the soluble active in 2D receptor, this was tried by Acceleron, and this, this inhibits even more signaling uh, than, than anything above it. And because of that, uh, the Acceleron trial did run into some difficulties uh, with some off-target toxicity. Uh, it had to be halted due to bleeding. Now, if you look at the next slide, this, this is really what you're doing when you put in the soluble active and 2B receptor. You're binding all of the ligands that bind to this receptor. And the ones that have the highest affinity are the ones to the, the leftmost on these curves and the lowest affinity to the right. And you can see TGF data itself just doesn't bind to this receptor. It doesn't signal through this receptor. But myostatin does. But myostatin is right here. Uh, whereas there are a number of things that bind much more tightly to the receptor than do myostatin. Some of these are activins, the same things that would bind to folostatin, but some of them are BMPs that would not bind to folostatin. And in particular, BMP9, which is involved in vascularization, may have been the, the problem uh, with the acceleron drug uh, and not a problem with any of the other uh, types of inhibitors that are, are being used. Uh, to a great extent. They're not sequestering the ligands, and so BMP9 would still be available uh, for signaling. So the other thing I wanted to address uh, is you may have noticed that unlike the trials that have come earlier with exon skipping and nonsense suppression, uh, we, we're now looking at trials with myostatin inhibition where uh, the forced air climb has become uh, the, uh, the endpoint that everyone seems to be interested in. And, and why is that? Well, it, it's very simple in, in terms of if you look, if you're looking at the younger boys where there's more muscle uh, that's still intact and therefore more muscle for myostatin to target and, and, and potentially uh, a greater potential to increase muscle size, um, you know, more like what we saw potentially in the dogs, uh, then uh, these, these for seroclime and some of these other time function tests like 10 meter walk run and supine to stand are likely to be much more sensitive to, to the increase in muscle mass because 
these functions really re require strength uh, on a number of muscle groups, especially the quadriceps, um, especially the the, the, vastus, the the various forms of the vastus um, muscle. And so if you were to increase their size, then likely you would be able to in, in improve performance on these time function counts. And what I'm showing here is data on, on uh, patients that we collected in our imaging trial. So this is our, our natural history study that we're doing with both functional testing and with MR imaging. And what you can see is that the boys who are not on corticosteroids uh, are taking longer to do these function tests than the boys who are on corticosteroids. And we think this is largely because of the fact that the corticosteroids are, are doing a couple of things. They're inhibiting inflammation, but they're also allowing more successful regeneration. And so you're actually able to build more muscle and, and, and stronger muscle. And so that's why we think these boys are able to perform better. And obviously the expectation based on all the animal work with myostatin in addition is it also will be able to drive more successful re regeneration and bigger and stronger muscles, and therefore you should see improvement in all of these time function tests, including the four stair climb. Now in the same age group, uh, and this is the age group that largely is being looked at in, in the trials of Pfizer and BMS, uh, we could not see changes in the six minute walk, uh, improvement in the six minute walk test with the corticosteroids, and that's because this is more of an endurance test and, and not as, not as um, sensitive to uh, muscle mass changes until the muscles are, are nearly lost. And then at the end, when the muscles are, are really failing, uh, then the small amount of remaining muscle mass is really critical to maintain the ability to do the six-minute walk. So this test is not very sensitive in these younger ambulatory boys uh, to any sort of therapeutic intervention we would predict. It's only uh, in later disease stages when they're in the last couple of years of ambulation that this becomes a very sensitive measure uh, in terms of, of how much muscle preservation can maintain the six-minute walk. So, so that's why uh, the shift in these earlier bo uh, boys and in a drug that is designed to increase muscle to something that really is going to focus on power rather than uh, on, on um, endurance. So in summary, uh, Myostatin inhibition is beneficial to surfing skeletal muscle in the animal mo models of, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, it shows hypertrophy in both juvenile and adult uh, animals uh, that, that are missing dystrophin. In the case of the adult animals, the, the hypertrophy is actually much greater than what we see in unaffected adult animals. And so I, I stress this point because I don't want anyone to be misled by the results in the healthy volunteers. I mean, I think they're significant, but I think they're, they're an underestimate of what we're likely to see in, in the boys with Duchenne because, number one, they're growing boys, and number two, the disease itself uh, really amplifies the myostatin effect. Uh, the force production, uh, I, didn't show you, I didn't show you this, but the force production is increased in the muscles, uh, relatively proportionate to the muscle size. So, so most of this is generating functional muscle. Uh, and the fibrosis in the muscles is decreased, uh, which probably is one of the big reasons why the regeneration is improved and, and manages to keep the muscle being rebuilt and actually rebuilds the muscle to a, a, a larger size. So in addition of other TGF beta family members other than myostatin, could be a potential source of side effects. And so, so I, I think, you know, the, the more specificity one can get, the, the better. Uh, now, it is true that some of these TGF family members also inhibit muscle growth, and so you might get bigger muscle with some of them. So it's a balance that one has, has to look at. And there are questions that remain about the long-term impact on the heart, uh, especially if you were going to go into a boy that has a significant cardiac disease, but it certainly doesn't appear that it, it accelerates uh, cardiac disease in any of our animal models, and therefore I think it's going to be very safe. But nonetheless, it will be carefully monitored uh, by either echo or cardiac MRIs in these boys to make sure that there is not uh, there are not any warning signs associated with this. So, so that's really all I had to say. So I'm happy to begin to take questions.
and go back and clarify any points that might have been unclear because uh, sometimes I get going and talk a little fast. So uh, thanks, thanks for all of you listening. Yes, Lee, thank you very much. That was really a terrific explanation of the various targets to inhibit myostatin, and we so appreciate it. I have a list of, of questions that have come in prior to the, to the webinar itself, and then we certainly will take a look and see what other questions come in. And one of the first ones um, maybe that you perhaps can address is the combination of steroids and the myostatin inhibition. Do you see that as synergistic or additive, or, or how do you see that, and have you looked at that in the animal models? Yeah, no, we, we haven't modeled it. I, in, in the MDX mice, it's actually quite difficult to model the steroid effects because the, the normal MDX mice that most of us use really have a detrimental uh, effect from the steroids. And that, that's probably because they have, they're, they're not that inflammatory. And the main benefit of, of the steroids is probably only realized in the background of a lot of inflammation. Um, because of that, we and others are now looking at other mouse models of, of dystrophy that uh, have more uh, inflammation and therefore could be a, a model you could address that question in. We haven't addressed it in the dogs just because of limitations of dog numbers. But there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be additive. I mean, we you may end up seeing less overall hypertrophy than you would with, with that than we did in our dogs without corticosteroids. On the other hand, it may amplify the the effect because now you're dampening down the inflammation directly. So I would not expect it to mask the effect. Uh, whether or not you get a bigger effect or a slightly smaller effect is unclear. But certainly, I, I think you will see the effect with or without steroids. And you wouldn't ex anticipate that you would see a negative effect? No, no, no. No, there's no reason to think that there would be any negative interaction of those pathways. Great. Thank you. And and then you talked about uh, during your presentation uh, your uh, the heart and the need for cardioprotection uh, or the recommendation for cardioprotection. Um, do you see this, uh, do you see that myostatin inhibi inhibition um, have you uh, have you observed anything in terms of smooth muscle, or and you did mention diaphragm in the mice as well, but could you address the, the respiratory muscles as well, smooth muscles, and the potential impact? Yeah, well, no, we saw benefit to the diaphragm. I, I just didn't put it in the presentation, but, but the diaphragm also had less fibrosis uh, and um, improved muscle mass and improved strength. So so the diaphragm also did, did benefit directly from the myostatin inhibition. Um, I don't think my stat, well, my stat doesn't signal in smooth muscle, so we didn't look at smooth muscle, but, but it, it's not involved in smooth muscle signaling, so one wouldn't expect it to do anything directly to the smooth muscle. Okay, thank you. Um, also, Lee, you mentioned that, especially in the healthy volunteers, the, the, um, the complete impact uh, or, the, or the benefit was about five, I think you said five to 10%, and um, you talked about intervening younger would, had, at least in the animal models, had given you a more significant impact. So one of the questions is uh, about improving in a non-ambulatory person. Could, do you think that there is a, a possibility of inhibiting myostatin would improve their ability to sit up straight and use their arms? Yeah, well, no, I, it, in the fully grown, the dogs were fully grown, so they, they were not growing. And we had, you know, tremendous amount of muscle hypertrophy um, by myostatin inhibition. And so the same should be the case in the non-ambulatory. Now, obviously, it depends on how much muscle is still remaining. It's not – what it's going to do is make the remaining muscle bigger, but the muscle that's been lost cannot come back. And so in a, in a, someone who's lost 80% of their vastus myeloralis, it's, it's, there's very little left to work with. But, but certainly uh, when arm function – uh, and diaphragm function is even if you're not inventory is still maintained then then you could improve it you could make those muscles bigger and slow the uh, progression of fibrosis so there's no doubt that myostatin inhibition could potentially be beneficial in in the older boys as well uh, I think you know that the challenge of doing the the trial at this point is having well validated outcomes uh, in these older boys as well as you know, here there, there is some reason to have a, a, a little bit of concern about what might be going on in the heart. And so I think by looking in the older, in the younger boys first, where there's very little risk, uh, as well as better defined uh, functional endpoints, uh, I think that's where we have to start. 
with the idea of if that looks very positive and very safe, then we need to figure out how to then move it in and to the older boys and, and again, make sure there are cardiac safeguards in place. Thank you. And, and you mentioned uh, the acceleron study that was halted for, for bleeding and telangiectasia. Um, so do you see, in terms of the pathways of GDF11, uh, do you see or anticipate what we as parents might look for in terms of adverse reaction? Or what, what we might, might think be thinking about or worried about? Well, I mean, the, you know, unlike the acceleron drug, which affected lots of tissues because and lots of different signaling molecules besides myostatin and GDF11, the two trials that are launching are relatively specific to those, and so um, the only the only side effects would be if they were to target other members of if if their neutralizing agents were to target other members of of the uh, TGF beta family, and so you would have to know what those were to know what the possible side effects are. Are I mean, if they very specifically target um, myostatin and GDF11 and nothing else, uh, then you, you wouldn't really expect anything going on except in the heart and skeletal muscle. So I, I can't really answer the question without knowing if their agents are selective or whether there are other things that they inhibit. And then once you knew what they inhibit, you could you could talk about what you need to monitor. Just like if you, with the acceleron drug, uh, there was a laundry list of things that was hitting. And, and so there were lots of things you could think about as possible off-target effects. Right. Thank you. And, and Lee, one of the questions that has come in is, are, are myostatin levels measurable, and are they being measured in these studies? Did you measure them in the animal models, and did they change over time, or do you know? Yeah, we, we measure them in our mice and, and dogs, and, and when we inhibit with the propeptide, we actually drive myostatin up in the circulation and down in the tissue. So, so we basically drive the myostatin out of the tissue and into the blood, so if you were to measure it in the blood, you'd say, oh, my God, you've raised my fat level. But, in fact, if you measure it in the muscle, it's down. Good. Thank you. And do you, to your knowledge, will they be measuring myostatin levels uh, on the children uh, participating in the various trials that are going on? Well, I assume they'll be measuring it in the blood, but not in the tissue unless you're taking biopsies. I, I, I don't remember if, if either of, of the trials involves biopsies. If they're not taking biopsies, then they'll just be measuring it in the blood. But in the blood, what they'll be doing, they'll, make, they'll be making sure that the myostatin is there and, and bound to their neutralizing agent. Um, and uh, to what extent it's, there's myostatin is not bound in a neutralizing agent they can evaluate. Uh, they won't be able to directly evaluate what, what there is uh, in the tissue unless they take a biopsy. Right. Okay, thank you. And you noted in your presentation that that you that the drug initially builds muscle, and and one of the questions is, does that imply that after a while it will cease to work? Uh, and could you talk to us about the long term of of uh, the long term effect of myostatin inhibition? Yeah, no, it doesn't cease to work. It, it reaches a steady state. I mean, the muscles don't continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, they they most of the growth uh, increases over the first that's coming from the myostatin is over the first uh, three to six months. Now, obviously, these are growing boys, and so they're going to, their muscles are going to continue to grow for a longer period. And that's the hope is that, you know, you'll start, you will see some of the continued growth that you would have as they get older and get larger uh, that normally, you know, you stop seeing at some point because they start just not replacing the muscle, uh, that that will continue with myostatin. And so that the, the muscles... Uh, we, you know, I, I don't know how much we'll see it in a human, but, but whatever you see after the first um, three to four months is probably the majority of the, the net increase from myostatin you're going to get. But it'll be maintained. As long as you maintain the myostatin, it'll be maintained. And what we, what we never did in our animal models was to take it away to see how long it's maintained after you take it away. But, but there are some experiments that would suggest that you would maintain the increase for a considerable period of time, even once you took the inhibitor away. And, and that, that's a nice thing because that allows you uh, maybe to take some drug holidays if any of the drugs have any, any problems. I mean, at this point, I'm not anticipating any problems from what's been made publicly available. But, uh, but at any rate, the, you, your effect wouldn't go away the day you stop taking it would be maintained for some period of time, um, but but it's important since the 
you know, for the parents to understand the muscles don't just keep getting bigger uh, and bigger and just re- till, till it looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. They do, they do plateau. Right. Thank you. So, Lee, I think one of the, one of the areas that's always on minds of, of our families and ourselves is the need for combination therapies. As you know, we sit in meetings and understand that the, the highest priority of benefit risk was to slow or stop progression. And so in this case, um, our concern is how, how do we think about combinations? And one of the questions is, do you feel that myostat inhibition would be useful in terms of nonsense suppression, exon skipping, and in the presence of other therapies? And could you give us a little thought to combinations? Yeah, well, now if you go back, I don't know if I can go back, but if I went back to my list that I showed early in the presentation, uh, I showed that because, you know, potentially everything on that list, uh, I think, it would be synergistic. Uh, I don't know how to do if, is any. Are you able to sh- show slide 11? I'm not sure I have control over this anymore. So all of, the, all of these various targets, I think, would be synergistic with each other. Uh, and so the idea would be to try to get them approved as, in, as monotherapies, but then uh, as, as rapidly as we could to try to combine them. So if you're talking about the first two, uh, be it either exon skipping or, or uh, nonsense suppression to get um, some replacement of dystrophin, then that would be incredibly synergistic with increasing muscle mass and regeneration because you could imagine that since we're not getting high enough levels of dystrophin to start, you know, basically to stop the disease process, that the, the in, interference with regeneration uh, it means that you're going to, over time, have fewer and fewer muscle fibers that can express dystrophin. Now, so, so inhibiting myostatin would increase regeneration, give you more top fibers to target, and, and, and therefore to get dystrophin in. Now, so, so myostatin would certainly benefit the exon skipping and nonsense suppression. Now, on the other hand, it, it works both ways. It's, it's a dual synergy. Because if you've got a little bit of dystrophin, uh, or dystrophin in some of the fibers, then that's going to stabilize those fibers relative to no dystrophin, and that means that it's going to require less regeneration, and therefore you'll use fewer satellite cells over time, which means the, the benefits of a myostatin inhibitory therapy could go on for a much longer period of time, potentially. So, so these two would be incredibly synergistic. You've already asked me about steroids. The anti-inflammatory action of steroids probably would also be synergistic with myostatin inhibition and with dystrophin replacement. So so the first three would all be. And, of course, making – Lily has a, a trial on with uh, with tadalafil to increase blood flow and uh, correct blood flow regulation in the muscle. If that were, if that were to, to work, uh, and we'll find out in, in the coming months, then, in fact, you know, having the muscles not go ischemic would allow them better survival and would be synergistic with all the first three. So already, you know, combining the first four uh, would be, uh, you know, amazing in terms of what they could, they, in combination, they could do for slowing the progression of this disease. And it goes on with calcium handling, especially in the heart and mitochondrial dysfunction in the heart, as well as, as in, in skeletal muscle. So, so all of these, I think, potentially – are, are good enough targets to get approval as monotherapy. And if we had drugs that did all six things on this list, then I think the boys should be on them all. Well, thank you, Lee. Yes, uh, and the quicker the better, I think. Um, uh, so we, we did receive a question. Uh, some of the questions that we've received for those on the phone are about the trials, the specific trials, whether it's uh, BMS's study, Pfizer's study, Regeneron study, and so on. Lee won't be addressing specific areas in terms of extension, dosing, et cetera, uh, opening up criteria or expanding criteria to include people beyond the stated criteria now or uh, extended access programs or, uh, for that matter, compassionate use. Those will come in a later trial when we have the companies, and, and they will be speaking directly to you on, on a webinar. So you can plan for that. But another question that came in, Lee, was really related to your animal models. When you um, when you did some, I believe it was gene therapy, to stimulate the liver to, to uh, inhibit myostatin, uh, can you just explain that a bit and review what happened there or what you did there? Yeah, well, I, I had the, the one slide on that. So the idea was, uh, 
maybe I can pull it back up or you can pull it back up. Let's see where was it? It was um I can't find it now. Oh, it's slide sixteen. So so the idea was that um we didn't want to have the muscle itself make the propeptide, um, because of the fact that uh, since the muscle is still dystrophic, if you don't put back dystrophin, then the muscle is still turning over. And so if you put AAV into a muscle that's turning over, uh, eventually you're going to lose uh, the viral transgene. So we, we we showed this, we did this with IGF-1 uh, at one point, and it took, in the mice, it took, you know, a matter of maybe five months before we totally lost all of the, the virus expressing it. So we wanted, we didn't want that to happen. And we wanted the, the muscles to see the propeptide uh, for the life of the animal. And so it's well known that uh, if you put AAV in the liver, it's very stable and can basically secrete proteins for the life of the animal. So we made an adeno-associated virus uh, with a liver-specific promoter driving the myostatin propeptide uh, and a sequence that would, that would allow the liver to secrete it into the blood. Uh, and so that's that's what we did. So the circulation then was full of uh, of the propeptide, which then got into the individual tissues, where it then displaced myostatin out of the muscles, uh, where we then could see it building up in the circulation. So uh, so that was the idea to not have the muscle make it. Uh, but it, this is much more, uh, I would say, analogous to uh, giving a systemic drug because. Basically, the, the inhibitor was given in the circulation. In this case, it wasn't being injected. It was being secreted by the liver. But the, the bottom line is the same. It wasn't being made in the muscle. Uh, the muscle was getting it from the blood. Good. Thank you. Now, there's still questions about the trials coming on. And, and I just wanted to, to let you know, both BMS as well as Pfizer have um, websites where you can ask questions, in addition to the fact that Please register on Duchenne Connect, and, and, and Lucas and Ann Martin will be happy to answer questions and, and discuss some of your questions on the trials. One, yeah, one, and, and Pam, Pam, one thing I'd like to add uh, while we're on the subject of trials, because I forgot, even though it was on my slide, I forgot to say something. So people know that the Myo29 Myo trial that uh, was done earlier um, by YF failed, uh, but and I should have commented that I, this was not a failure of the approach. This was a failure of that specific antibody. Uh, when that antibody has gone back and been examined, uh, it, it really was deficient in its ability to get into the muscle and target the myostatin. So in no way should that failed trial with myo-29 uh, dissuade anyone from being involved in the new trials because the new antibodies uh, or the new neutralizing agents, since they're not all antibodies, um, are much better at getting into the tissue and targeting myostatin than was that antibody. And so we have not had a fair test of, of this approach in humans yet, uh, and we're about to. Thank you. And, and Lee, how is myostatin cleared from the blood? Do you see any long-term renal issues in clearing it? Well, we, we, we looked very carefully at the, the renal histology uh, as well as the liver histology in our, in our dogs and saw no no signs, well, we didn't, we had pathologists do it, and there were no signs of any renal toxicity. So uh, it, you know, nor, it's normally in the blood. I mean, obviously there's going to be a uh, little more than, than usual in the blood at any one time, but, but it, it doesn't seem to pose any challenges for, for, for the kidney. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Mike Bink suggested that, that this is when you were speaking about the WISE trial. It was also not examined in DMD or in children during that study at all. So, um, again, um, I urge you to join Duchenne Connect. Uh, speak to Ann Lucas and Ann Martin about these trials. Also, the BMS and Pfizer website will give you additional information. Any additional questions you have, please send forward to us, and we will do our best to answer in writing. This webinar will be archived on our site, and the slide's available to those of you who wish to see it again or for uh, people who've joined late. And we certainly hope you will join us for another webinar um, with involving the companies, both Regeneron and BMS as Pfizer. And we wish again to thank our educational partners, BMS and Pfizer, for offering this opportunity to our community. Thank you so much, and thank you, Lee, for joining us and, and conducting the webinar, and thanks to all of you.